Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you for your patience. Thank you, Minister of Power. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick rundown of today's event um, and just a few reminders for everybody. Uh, one, uh, the event, for those of you who are familiar with Inside Diplomacy, we will have about 30-ish 30, 30 minutes of discussion, and then we'll open it the floor to audience Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, which I assume you will, please type your questions into the Q&A portion of your Zoom screen. Um, try to keep the questions as concise as possible. I think there'll be a lot of questions and we won't have a ton of time to get to all of them. So um, uh, the event is being recorded. We will, uh, once the recording is cleaned up, we will place it on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, and we'll also send it out to everybody who registered. Uh, so I think that's all from me. And now to get us started off formally, uh, I would like to introduce AFSA's president, Ambassador Eric Rubin. Thank you so much and welcome to Administrator Power and to everyone who's joining us today. We have a really good turnout and um, I wanna thank Administrator Power for including us on her schedule in a very busy day. Uh, but uh, first of all, let me just start out by welcoming everyone. For those of you who are new to AFSA, uh, we are both a professional association and the union of the US Foreign Service in six agencies, uh, almost 17,000 members. And uh, we're very proud to have Ambassador Power as part of our series Inside Diplomacy, uh, where we tackle some of the most pressing issues facing US diplomacy, foreign assistance, development assistance, uh, and all the challenges facing our country in the very challenging world that we're facing. Um, I'm joined today by our USAID Vice President, Jason Singer. We're both active duty uh, Foreign Service as well as AFSA staff. And it looks like we have a lot of both members and guests today. So I'm very excited about that and hoping we can have an excellent conversation. So uh, without further ado and without wasting time, uh, just a few words of introduction. Uh, yesterday marked the 60th anniversary of the creation of the U.S. Agency for International Development, and Administrator Power just gave a very important speech on that occasion about the way forward for the agency and for our country, uh, reflecting on the lessons learned and the successes over the past 60 years, but also challenges going forward in a world that has changed so much since President Kennedy and his administration uh, and President Kennedy signed the Foreign Assistance Act with bipartisan support in Congress. Uh, today, we have Administrator Samantha Power here to talk to us about that agenda, that legacy, but also the path forward uh, following her speech today at Georgetown. And we'll wanna talk a little bit about that if we can. Um, so without further ado, let me just introduce her. She was sworn in on May 3rd as the 19th Administrator of USAID. Uh, before joining the administration, she was the Anna Lynn Professor of the Practice of Global Leadership and Public Policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and also the William Zabel Professor of Practice in Human Rights at Harvard Law School. From 2013 to 2017, Ambassador Power served in the Obama administration as the 28th U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations. We are very lucky to have us with her here today. So uh, without any further delay, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Ambassador Samantha Power. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's, great, it's great to be here. Um, uh, Eric, does it make sense for me to just offer a, a, a few opening thoughts about, um, maybe I can summarize, assuming that not everybody was tuned in at 10 a.m. Uh, to uh, a relatively lengthy, substantive effort to sum my, summarize uh, my reform priorities. Um, so, so I will just... I will, that's okay. Start by doing that. Do. Um, fantastic. So, um, it, basically, the sort of three pillars of our reform agenda, as we've articulated them, um, entail um, an emphasis on making USAID more accessible, more equitable, um, and more responsive. And so, those are sort of like being for motherhood and apple pie on one level. Um, but what I tried to do today, and it's a nice coincidence that we have this session today so we can drill into it a little further, is, you know, put some meat on the bones there and, and also acknowledge, you know, where we have fallen short up to this point, acknowledge all the gravity that, that cuts in the opposite direction sometimes. Uh, so it's not to uh, act as though 
um, you know, uh, making significant strides in any of these areas is going to be is going to be easy. There, there's there are a lot of bureaucratics and hydraulics, as I've come to understand, they're referred to, uh, that stand in the way. But the accessibility uh, point, and again, I won't go into the details of the speech, but um, uh, start foundationally with the with the workforce and making sure that we are recruiting and retaining a workforce that looks like America. And I offer details about, uh, you know, where we are okay in terms of representativeness, in terms of numbers, uh, but even that can be misleading. So African-Americans and, and um, Asian-American employees, you know, are, are sort of, we're, we're relatively near the kind of uh, the, the, the benchmarks that one would expect, but it kind of shrouds the extent to which um, uh, some of those individuals are, are, are not represented in, in policy circles or in technical circles or not at the senior leadership level where the numbers kind of taper off. And I was just meeting, I was late, unfortunately, because I was meeting with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and we were talking there where the numbers were not anywhere near um, looking like America when it comes to um, uh, Hispanic members of the workforce um, and talking about what, what more we can do to recruit and recruit in different places. Um, and not just at private universities, um, but at, at public universities, we've, we've moved out with uh, historically black colleges and universities. I just did a historic MOU with Delaware State University and we're looking at a, um, some really interesting food security partnerships there, but also making sure that young people at a university like that get exposed to what USA does early and get exposed to international development coursework early so that we can plant the seed as it were um, and, and then hopefully uh, recruit people into what are now gonna be paid internships knowing that unpaid internships uh, disproportionately penalize people uh, from underrepresented communities. So we talked a lot about, uh, again, the workforce but also other aspects of the workforce that uh, that you all have been focused on, um, you know, questions about how we get our foreign service and civil service numbers uh, way up, much more propor proportional and commensurate uh, to the programming that those individuals are being asked to take on. Um, and this, of course, will be an ongoing dialogue with, with Congress to go beyond where we are, but making sure that there's equity among people at the agency um, who work under different authorities, you know, that if you are working in a danger zone um, as a as a contractor that you know you have health insurance and life insurance and and other benefits uh, these are all uh, you know strangely hard to achieve um, and probably the most efficient way to achieve them is actually just to actually have a workforce that is uh, much more constituted by uh, direct hire um, uh, employees and, and so that's the direction we're going to move in uh, but nonetheless, for as long as we are putting people into harm's way to do America's work, uh, we want to look out for those people. I also talked about FSNs, our foreign service nationals who are the beating heart of our work and provide all the continuity. This is more than 4,500 people out of our 10,000 person strong workforce. And uh, definitely opportunities have expanded um, for FSNs over the years prior to my time, um, but there are still again, uh, ceilings really on what even our most uh, talented and capable FSNs can do. So, so pushing there and, and seeing what more opportunities we can uh, provide for those individuals. So, so that's sort of broadly workforce accessibility issues. There's also um, how we partner in new ways with the private sector because the, the resources that USAID is expending or all all foreign assistance really from governments is so much less than what we need in an era of a pandemic with these development gains being set back with climate and displacement and conflict and everything you know about um you know this question of how we engage the private sector at scale uh looms over a lot of our work so i offered some thoughts about how we would um uh initiate some more flexible uh funding that would enable us again to to make modest investments on the front end and leverage those investments we're about at a one to six investment when we do public private partnerships when we invest a dollar we can usually leverage that for six dollars which is good 
Um, but so far it's been, um, it's, it's pretty hard to work with USAID as some of you know. Uh, and, and so uh, as a result, it's mainly very large uh, private sector entities uh, that have been able to, to, to embark upon those partnerships with us we we tend to do projects you know rather than kind of scale things and i don't think we have yet taken advantage of the leverage that the private sector can have in pushing uh, for example for certain regulatory reforms that actually could be transformative in terms of the economic climate so that's about accessibility there's a lot more to say there second area um which i'll just touch upon briefly because i suspect it'll come up in the discussion but is relates to you know, making aid more more equitable, and here the the emphasis um, is on uh, you know how we partner and and truly partner uh, with local organizations, local businesses more than we are currently doing, and and there again it's a little bit like the point I, I was making earlier, but there's a kind of disparate impact of USAID's rules and regulations on smaller organizations and on local organizations because they are more prone to lack the kind of accounting and lawyering that you might need to do a contract with USA that might be hundreds of pages long. So every USAID administrator in modern memory before me has embarked on a so-called localization agenda and I'm going to join the ranks proudly. We're going to try to learn from what's been done in the past, but we do know uh, that this does require more staffing on the USAID side in the short and medium term in order to be able to kind of left seat, right seat with a local organization and offer some of that support in the accounting area or in the in um, meeting the various regulatory and fiduciary uh, requirements that, that partnering with USAID entails. So we, we, we announced today a pilot, a $300 million pilot over four years uh, focus specifically on uh, partnering with local organizations in Central America, in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. And I will say, just to because this sounds maybe again uh, so obvious, of course we would be partnering with local organizations. What is sustainable development if not that? But the the all the efforts made at localization have had us go from about four percent of our assistance going uh, to local organizations to, with all of the effort and the help from Capitol Hill and the help from some of you, I think we're now close to 6%. So that's, I think we can do better. And so we set the objective of that being at least a quarter uh, within four years. And then and then related, but, but, but separate local voices, um, again, so obvious, but in our design and implementation, just making sure that whether it's co-creation or local actors are in the lead, um, we're going to work toward ensuring that that happens at least half of the time. And we're not close to that right now, unfortunately, so we have a long way to go there. But between the local partnership and contracting and grants and uh, ensuring that the, irrespective of who gets the contract or the grant, that, that what it is that we are grant making around is conceived of by the people at the front lines in these communities. I think that's going to be very important. And then the last thing, which is maybe I'm sure a lot of our discussion will take us into some of these areas, but just to touch a little more on USAID's substantive priorities right now, um, making aid more responsive. I used uh, several examples of, again, listening uh, to the countries with which we are working on the key challenges of our time. Who's not for that? Everyone should be for that. But um, some examples are on COVID, we are providing 1.2 billion vaccines so far. Those are in the pipeline or have 200 million have been delivered. But what we're hearing, particularly from Sub-Saharan Africa, but not only from there, is a desire to make their own vaccines and for this to be the crisis that creates the opportunity to have more indigenous capacity. So too, the kind of uh, early detection, early warning pandemic systems that we are um, trying to build through our global health security work, partnering actually with foundations as well. On that, um, you know, that is, those are the indigenous capacities that, that, that countries want for themselves. They want to be in a position uh, to be able to raise flags. It's in our interest, of course, as the United States for that to happen. 
but that entails again more investments in local health workers in you know more deeper partnerships with health ministries um, you know there's no work around really when it comes to surveillance for the indigenous uh, health infrastructure that exists and so how to make that fit for purpose given the vulnerabilities we know exist that's just about listening to 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 the demand signal from those countries it's not only about listening but it starts with listening and then on climate, similarly, I think President Biden's adaptation announcement this week, PREPARE, which some of you might be tracking, the president's emergency plan uh, for adaptation or resilience. I think that's a reflection of listening and hearing, uh, you know, that we are very, very focused on bringing down emissions and must remain urgently focused on that task if we are to hold warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a major stretch goal. Uh, but at the same time, we we need to make resources available to support countries in adapting to the climate shocks and climate harms that are already upon them. And that's what PREPARE would do. It would reach, in principle, 500 million people. Um, it would We would be seeking $3 billion a year in financing specifically for adaptation, at, even as alongside that, of course, we have our programming and trying to, to get countries to, to convert to renewables. And then the very last example I'd offer, and then and then we'll dig into the questions, is um, is on democracy, where democracy has been on its back heel, and yet before the pandemic, we saw more protests happening around the world than at any point in modern recorded history, and more than half of them were fueled by concern about corruption. So USAID is uh, in the process, I think, of offering a lot of thought leadership, learning from thought leaders outside of government, of course, but on what kind of tailored modern democracy programming looks like, how we meet reformers like those in Zambia, Moldova, Dominican Republic right now, try to meet them with the kind of high level political attention that they are seeking, try to flow private sector investment to places that are making tough political reform choices um, and catalyze that flow. Uh, so there are those kinds of questions, but also being more creative, and I announced today the creation of something I'm, I'm very, very happy about, which grew out of a conversation with anti-corruption reformers my first week in the job. And they mentioned that the, the business model for the corrupt is to sue journalists and NGOs who are scavenging, you know, and, and digging into uh, the uh, stolen assets or the foreign bank accounts or the embezzlements. And they they are just have been oligarchs and illiberal actors have been increasingly successful uh, in effect trying to drive out of business independent media and NGOs who do this kind of work. So what we announced today was a, uh, a in a sense, a counter defamation fund, um, which would offer people who do this kind of work insurance so that they'd be in a position to withstand those kinds of lawsuits. And we would seek to multilateralize this fund, get other stakeholders to chip in. But it's an example of really hearing from people on the front lines what it is they need in this moment, you know, as distinct from kind of adjusting modestly our democracy programming over time as we have done to, to, to try to take a fresh look in 2021, uh, given disinformation, cyber threats, you know, the way um, extremist forces are learning from one another across borders uh, and, and the role that corruption and, and, and movement across borders is, is playing, what's our answer? What's a fresh answer to that? And, and hearing from people who, who know best um, how, what implications that has for our programming. So that in a nutshell, uh, accessibility, uh, rendering it more equitable and trying to be responsive to these substantive ideas in each of these policy domains. Um, that's what I've spoken to now uh, today. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Power. And I think that some of the questions that we have from the audience uh, in advance have been answered by some of your initial remarks. So I'm going to try to uh, pick some that bring us into some new areas. And then we already have a bunch of questions from the audience, so we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, but let me start out with what I think is a very good question. Um, it reads, there's a lot of discussion about the US re-engaging in the world, leading with diplomacy and reclaiming a global leadership position. The role of USAID has especially taken a higher profile in the Biden administration. 
with USAID being part of the NSC for the first time since its creation. Can you talk about why this is an important development and where you see USAID's role in our global re-engagement? I mean, thanks. I, I think that President Biden's UN General Assembly speech was, was pretty interesting in this regard. I mean, framing this inflection point in our history as moving away from relentless war and the sort of the turn, the quick turn to the military tool in the toolbox that has characterized American foreign policy for a long time to what he called relentless diplomacy and, and development. And it really is a, you know, a fulsome um, uh, account of, of his recognition that these tools are lower cost, higher impact, um, and, and unfortunately, again, it, it too often have been underutilized. And so, so that's anyway, the frame, I think. And then in terms of the bureaucratics, I think that the elevation of USAID to the NSC, I mean, I'll, I'll just say a word about, I think what's new about it, but also want to stress the continuity with my predecessors. I think what's new is it just, just hadn't happened before, you know, to have, um, you know, the president make that decision to elevate it and to, and the, the, the you know, the decision is important, but it's really, what's important is it's a reflection of, again, what was in that general assembly speech and what, what president Biden believes, which is that you have to have the three legs of the stool, you know, defense, diplomacy, and development. If anyone is too short uh, or not invested in enough, the, the stool kind of topples over in the same way that any country pursuing its own development, you know, you have the economic opportunity, the security, uh, and then the governance. And so too, if any one of those legs is too short, the stool topples over as we see in so many places these days. So I think he just sees it that way. It's pretty intuitive. It's, you know, how are you gonna deal with the pandemic? You absolutely have to have USAID in the room talking about our efforts to strengthen health systems and get countries ready for those vaccine doses to land and, you know, continue investments in testing and PPE or because we know that even with vaccines, there's still infections and how do you deal with climate change? Well, you need the world's premier adaptation agency, which is USAID uh, and has been thinking for years about the adjustments in our food security programming that have to come about because of the changing climate. So it's just, it's kind of intuitive and, and it's important that it's been formalized, but it's a reflection uh, just of the, the, the kinds of challenges that are landing on, on any president's desk, you know, when they, every, every, every day and, and the impossibility of, of a narrow toolbox to meet this set of challenges. I think where there's continuity is USAID has always, you know, in, in pursuit of its mission, uh, pursued policy and program in, in parallel. And USAID has always, you know, been in particular principles meetings or particular, uh, you know, and, and Mark Green had a, had, uh, you know, a standing seat, as I understand it, the deputies table, he, he built a national security advisor kind of office or cell in the, in the front office of USAID that, that is terrific and that I inherited. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's never been a way really of, of thinking about development purely as programming. You know, we, we, we can't, we, for weeks, months even, we haven't been able to get into Tigray to provide food. That's not because we don't have the food. It, there's a policy issue here, which is that the Ethiopian government hasn't been allowing us to move that food. Um, we have $700 million that uh, as a government as a whole, a large share of which will be, um, uh, it, you know, um, deployed by USAID in Sudan in the wake of the opening and the democratic transition there. And we absolutely, prior to the military takeover in the last week or two, uh, were through OTI and others, you know, providing laptops to the new justice ministry and trying to be supportive in terms of social safety nets as they make tough economic reforms. But when a military takeover occurs, USAID needs to be at the table helping inform the U.S. position on how we respond and, you know, what does it mean for our assistance? I mean, people are still hurting. 
Um, and they're hurting more, in fact, right, by virtue of the military takeover. And so which funds do you pause? Which do you continue? You know, these are these are policy questions that have profound impacts on the dignity and the and the and the welfare of of our, the, the the people that we partner with in these countries. So, so I would you know again I think it's an important recognition of the new of the it's not even new any but but the, of the reality of the kinds of problems that and challenges that we're facing and that's good that it's been formalized. Um, it, it, it certainly asks a lot of the USAID staff to both be, you know, thinking constantly about, okay, how are we going to program, but also, you know, how, how, what, what kind of policy do we think the United States should have that will strengthen our hand in bringing about development outcomes? You know, that's a lot to, for, for, for us to, to take on, but, but to think you can do program without policy or policy without program, I think would, would be misguided at, at this time, given, given the nature of the threats. Great, thank you so much. And um, I think we're gonna take one more uh, advanced question. And then we have a list of questions submitted by the audience. And I wanna be sure we can get to as many of them as possible. So um, the first one, uh, the last one I'll take on the submitted questions is, as part of your vision, you described how USAID plans to empower and support staff across the different hiring mechanisms, which is great. Can you tell us more about the plans for empowering USAID's foreign service in particular? Uh, thank you so much. Well, I think it starts, um, and Eric, you and I have talked about this, uh, with, um, having a real bias toward the field, which, which I bring from my, my field days as I started my career as a, as a reporter and bring, I suppose, an inherent mistrust <laughs> of things I hear in capitals uh, and really always want to get out there with my backpack and my roll of dollar bills and my notebook and my pen. And, and that's what I love about our foreign service. I was just giving the speech at Georgetown and got to meet with the Payne Fellows Mm -hmm. um, there who not only were from Georgetown, but from GW and from other universities in the area. And it's just so exciting, you know, to imagine them as incoming foreign service officers and, and all that lies ahead in their first postings and then where they go from here. So, so I think just to signal that, um, we want the field perspective integrated as much as possible. Um, and the headquarters perspective has a very important role and can often see the full field and know what the dynamics are on the Hill or in the interagency. Um, but it's extremely important uh, that, and it, especially in light of what I was talking about earlier about, you know, bringing local voices to the fore, you know, for our mission directors, um, uh, you know, our most senior uh, foreign service officials uh, to, to be, integrated and take advantage of this post COVID or current COVID use of technology and so forth. Like the, the you know, the kinds of, um, the, the, the ways we used to interact were so different, you know, a year and a half ago, and now it presents an opportunity for the field to come closer. Uh, and I want to, I want to think about how we're going to do that. It's going to be foreign service officers. who are going to help me, help me think that through. Um, I think the size of the foreign service is still not commensurate with the needs of the agency. Um, I think, I think that's evident. It's good that we finally hit those, uh, congressional targets for the foreign service and the civil service. Uh, but, uh, again, happily we have bipartisan support, uh, for the work that we do in global health in providing in responding to humanitarian emergencies in food security. Um, uh, and so on and so on and so on. But, um, you know, I think making those in investments in, uh, expanding the size of the foreign service, recognizing that people are on fumes right now, uh, at every, at every level, at every grade, frankly, under every hiring authority and bringing in the reinforcements will be important. And then, you know, I think there's a set of, this is a little weedy maybe, but, but some would be interested, you know, just, there's a set of human resource and talent management questions around promotion, around intellectual opportunities and training and so forth. And, and all of that is on the table. It's just like getting 
an understanding of where we are now and what the aspirations are uh, of uh, our stalwart foreign service. Great, thank you. We definitely uh, share that vision and wanna help make it happen. So you can count on us for that. Um, I did just wanna add that we, along with, I hope most Americans hope that we'll see an FY21 budget soon. Obviously we're not gonna see it next week or the week after, but uh, that consensus we do seem to have on increasing staffing uh, requires a budget to to implement. So we're gonna hope that that happens. 22, 22. 22, I'm sorry, yes, 22. I wanna make sure we're not also- Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's correct. Sorry about that, yes, 22. So I think we got good, if you just, just to get, again, a little weedy, the Senate bill, I think it recognizes what, what, what you uh, have been advocating for and what I've been advocating for, and I think the challenge is the House bill came out before the president's budget request was submitted. And so I think we have some work to do in conference to ensure that we we preserve that, but it's just foundational, you know, again, I, I've talked about policy and program, but it's all about people, right? We don't have the people and treat the people and, and you know, nurture uh, the environment here for those people to grow and develop, um, you know, policy and program will not, we will not optimize. Great. Well, we'll do everything we can from our side as well. Thank you. And now let me uh, turn back over to Nadia, who's been uh, looking at curating and putting together the questions from the audience, and we have a lot of them. So um, let me ask her to, to start with those. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, and thanks to everyone who has submitted um, lots and lots of questions. We will try to get through as many as uh, we can today. Um, the a lot of questions actually have to do, not surprisingly, uh, with the Foreign Service, the state of the USAID Foreign Service in the future. So why don't I start off with the following question. Today, USAID has no career FSOs nominated to any Senate conferred positions, and the counselor position is vacant. The majority of USAID employees in Washington are non-career staff. What are your plans to elevate the FS field experience and perspective in Washington? Thanks. Um, well, let me let me just say that um, there's a, a, a structural challenge that the State Department and USAID are facing, which is um, that of Senate confirmations generally. Um, if we had had this meeting, I think Eric and I met uh, more than a month ago, and uh, I was the only Senate confirmed official at USAID. So there's the obvious issue of congressional holes that are extremely uh, damaging and disruptive, but there's also, um, you know, the, 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 the challenges of, of vetting at the beginning of an administration and, and kind of where we are. So, so right now we, we are lucky uh, that both, I have created a new deputy position, as you know, one for policy and program, the other for management. Um, and Paloma uh, Adams, is with us and is already just doing such a tremendous job looking at um, some of these questions that have come up around not only the Foreign Service, but again, all uh, the workforce issues. And so just having her, she's only been there for three weeks and I already feel like it's night and day and Isabel Coleman was just confirmed yesterday as a policy deputy. So that's, that's huge, um, but you will, I, I can't get ahead of the vetting process, but you certainly will see Foreign Service officers um, promoted um, and uh, represented at the senior levels of USAID um, at the assistant administrator uh, level, no question. We're not where we need to be in getting our, our Senate, our appointees in, our assistant administrators in. Um, and uh, and I, wish, I wish I could wave a wand and, and change that. It's, it's, it's a very, very unfortunate set of dynamics, again, that relate to the Hill, but also uh, just the length of the, the, the vetting process, but watch that space. And then I think on the council position, we should have an announcement, you know, in the, in the next few days, I suspect. And so I'm very, very excited about where we're going to get on, on that. Okay. We'll switch gears a little bit. Um, to a question about China, um, as the United States continues to place more focus on competition with China, what foreign policy objectives and actions should the U.S. pursue, particularly in the areas of the world where China is investing more than the U.S., like Africa and South America? Um, are there areas for cooperation with China in these places? Thank you. Um, well, I would I'd start uh, 
perhaps unsurprisingly, just taking note of USAID's comparative advantages, America's comparative advantages, and um, I think actually COVID uh, offers insights into a, a few dimensions of this here. So on the front end, of course, um, you know, the uh, domestic response inside China to the outbreak uh, left a lot to be desired, but was reflective uh, also of a, of a governing system that um, penalizes dissent, um, uh, where people who raise alarm bells, whistleblowers get detained. Um, much has been made of then, you know, later and China being able to you know, quarantine people and do things that that uh, countries that respect human rights, uh, you know, may not be able to do. But I, I don't think one can look past just the extent to which um, uh, stymieing, you know, or, 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 or sort of um, needing to please the boss <laughs> uh, sort of informed the the uh, the early days of the response and then all that has come since. And when it comes to vaccines, where where China brought a vaccine online very quickly, uh, as did American companies, some with American government support, with Operation Warp Speed, um, you know, it is really, really striking that the United States is giving its vaccines away to low uh, income countries and lower middle income countries. That's what we do. We're giving those vaccines away. And that is not the approach uh, that that China has taken. And I think that even though China was able to begin to distribute uh, vaccines to many developing countries, including in our own hemisphere, well before us, you know, you have not seen the kind of soft power bump that you would have expected, in part because the 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 the, meth the mode by which those vaccines have been deployed is very very transactional where it's you do this and therefore in exchange, here's what we need you to do on Taiwan or here's how we need you to vote at the UN. So I think this approach on our side that, you know, emphasizes the welfare of the people in the countries in which we work, and especially again, if we elevate their voices and partner with them more directly um, and uh, that emphasizes uh, democratic accountability or the rule of law and the accountability of institutions, which is where given the salience of corruption right now, I think a lot of citizens are living around the world like really concerned about that in their societies, whether it's the concentration of power, or the concentration of resources, there's a ton of concern about that. And then taking advantage of the network of alliances that we have, I think also when it comes to our assistance, there's the assistance that we can give and then as we see at the G7 and, and even out of the G20, when we can multilateralize what we can offer in this way that is um, divined through collaborative and not, you know, not fiat, but, you know, a kind of deliberative co-design process. But if we can scale what we do by bringing other democracies on board, that is a very uh, potent develop and attractive uh, development partnership, I, I think, for other countries and peoples to to embrace. Uh, so, so that's sort of how I see it. And then the question, briefly, about opportunities, you know, for collaboration. I mean, every day, and I you know I know this from my last job, the 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 United States has the chance to be promoting peace and security or a whole set of development objectives at the UN with China, um, in the sense that. Nothing can go through the UN Security Council without China and the US's acquiescence. That's the nature of the veto. Um, and it's unfortunate that um, I think I think that the Security Council's role is sort of shriveled up in part because uh, of the the China's you know elevation of or in invocation of sovereignty to the point where you know, there's a reluctance to talk about using food as a weapon of war, or, uh, you know, in the Ethiopian context, or, uh, you know, even the, you, you could imagine far stronger statements on, on what's happening in Afghanistan. I mean, given 
the destabilizing effects of shutting women out, you know, from positions of influence and, and from schools and so forth. So, so, you know, I think there, those opportunities exist every single day. Um, but it really, it does require a greater recognition, I think, on the part of China that, um, that what can seem like an internal affairs issue very quickly metastasizes into something very destabilizing uh, and undermining of peace and security. Climate is the other area. It's, you know, this would be the perfect time to see that kind of, um, uh, you know, work in parallel at the very least. And yet uh, we really don't have uh, President Xi or China showing up in Glasgow with anywhere near the ambition that we know the, the, the planet demands. So, but I come back to the point when I talked about comparative advantages, again, in, in bringing democracies uh, together and in it's more than more than just democracies in Glasgow, but in bringing 65% of the world's economies together around this 1.5 degree Celsius ambition, holding it to that, you know, even though China's not inside the tent where we would wish that they would be, and we need them to be, given that they account for more than a quarter of the world's emissions, um, consolidating that coalition of that 65% um, in the wake of Glasgow puts much more pressure on China. So when we can't get China to come in and, and, and accelerate progress on something like climate change, there are still steps we can take to make a dent in the problem, but also to put ourselves in a stronger position, hopefully where, where China's calculus will change uh, in, the, in the near term. Thank you. The next question goes, uh, again, switching gears a little bit. Uh, this past year was the deadliest year for aid workers around the world. How does this impact USAID's overall mission and how does this organization need to adapt to keep staff safe? Well, I mean, one of the things I mentioned today, and I forgive, I might have, I think I mentioned it earlier here too, um, but is, you know, that um, the lion's share of our personnel who work in some of the most dangerous places doing uh, humanitarian response uh, are, and I, I'd like to see those numbers over time, actually, but are, if they ever were foreign service and, and, and civil service uh, direct hires and career staff, they certainly are no longer. <laughs> I mean, we're looking at, you know, 90% or something are contractors in our Global Health Bureau, in our Conflict Stabilization Bureau, and our Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs, the, the old uh, OFTA. So, um, and those, uh, the, the benefits available to career staff are not available uh, to our contractors in, in, in the same way. And, and so you, you often have a circumstance of, of people going to really dangerous places and, and going without, without life insurance or without even health insurance. So those are the kinds of issues that we're, we're looking at and that I, I spoke to earlier in terms of, um, you know, staff, uh, equity and staff safety. Then there's the broader set of questions about how the United States engages in the countries that we are in. And, you know, Secretary Blinken is grappling with this as well. You've probably, you all, some of you have had dialogue with him on this matter. I think there is a desire to lean in further and be more expeditionary, I think is the term that, that folks use. Uh, but, you know, even, even through this period where we've been uh, you know, the, 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 the concern about Fortress America has, has grown up post 9-11 or post Benghazi. I mean, USAID staff have, have really, I think, done everything in their power to be outside the gates, uh, particularly again, knowing that our foreign service nationals are by definition outside the gates, living with their families and in their communities. So, so that those are risks that our, our uh, teammates have been taking um, every day. And I think when you ask about what one can do about the growing impunity, this is where uh, it's just incredibly important that there be accountability that we do not let up uh, when aid workers uh, are harassed and intimidated or worse. Um, we've seen, I think, more than 18 aid workers killed in the Ethiopian, uh, just the last year. It's, we've just hit the one year anniversary. Um, and, and just, you know, even if, 
if we could get a peace agreement tomorrow, the accountability for those debts staying on that um, and and uh, doing so again in as united a international community as possible. This is where China and Russia being, you know, sort of outside of that community of condemnation and of accountability is really is really problematic because you see governments or uh, you know armed actors, uh, militia, and others just knowing that it's that they can sort of play different countries off each other. And these are the kinds of things we, we in the immediate wake of the end of the Cold War, everybody could agree upon. It's wrong to to harm aid workers who are there to help your people, period. Um, and now there's just much more moral relativism, you know, in the way that uh, different countries come together or don't come together in the international institutions. So pushing to go to get more of that consensus, I think also is is very important. Okay, I think um, I'd like to be able to squeeze in two more questions. I know you have a busy schedule, but if we can, um, the next question is about, um, you had mentioned recruitment of more diverse um, staff for USAID, but let's talk a little bit about retention. Um, how do you operate, operationalize the culture of belonging that you mentioned? So it's not enough to just recruit, but we need to make sure that people are staying. Yeah, I mean it's a very it's it's complex, and what we've been doing in the last few months, um, we've Dennis Vega, who some of you know, is our, our deputy chief of staff uh, for management and reform, and now with Paloma coming on, and working with our management team and HCTM and others, is to really dig into, you know, when people leave, why do they leave, and and those exit surveys or exit interviews have not been systematic. Um, by any means, I do, I do think the two are related. I, you know, I'm hopeful that as you know, we go, I went a couple of weeks ago to Delaware State University to do the first MOU, uh, with, with them on, on a food security partnership, which I think is a very exciting endeavor and, and hope to be traveling, uh, in the next couple of weeks to Tuskegee University as well, um, in a similar vein, but that when one sees, for example, senior leadership that looks like America as we as we recruit and and you know again put our uh, appointments where our mouths are, as it were. Um, but but so too as they see, you know how much um, time and and energy we are expending on diversifying our partnerships, diversifying our workforce. You know that that itself. Uh, it's not sufficient, but that that signals um, uh, a, uh, that that speaks to the the uh, a prioritization that cuts across the board. I mean, I've spent been here now already six months and meeting with the different employee resource groups, whether on disabilities or with Arab Americans, as I had the chance to do just in the last week, or um, you know, with our our big group. Uh, or with Hispanic American, I mean, just the, the the overlap of the concern, but also the specifics of the concerns, um, you know, it really does, it really, you have to talk to people and you have to learn what it is that is making them feel looked past or undervalued within the culture. So part of my answer is hiring people and appointing people who have internalized this agenda as fiercely as I have, um, bringing the right the right mix of patience and impatience. I err on the side of impatience, um, and and uh, maybe maybe others might err on the side of patience. Uh, but somehow together, you have to have a certain amount of patience because that's what's going to take, uh, you know, to change ADSs and and reporting requirements and work with the Hill. And I mean, there's a huge amount of patience is required. But, but making sure that we have pretty soon defined what success would look like after a year, after four years, and then what the longer, the longer play is. Thank you. Um, I think this may be the final question. We've gotten actually several versions of this question about what's happening in Afghanistan um, and what will happen with USAID and Afghanistan. So what role do you see USAID having in Afghanistan in the near future, if any? And can you summarize USAID's efforts in working with multilateral agency organizations to get Afghanistan through the winter and beyond? 
Well, let, let me say that um, the, the, just because so many of you have a connection either with Afghanistan or in general with um, our diplomatic and development work overseas, that we cannot lose sight of our locally employed staff and our implementing partner staff who, uh, if, if it's locally employed staff and FSNs for USAID, uh, who have evacuated from Afghanistan, if it's implementing partners, some have, many haven't, many would like to, and are still there and are at risk. And so just want to stress that, um, you know, again, the departure of the U.S. military doesn't mean the, the end of our commitment to people who've served with us and, and invested in this, in this project, you know, this decades long, uh, effort, um, to bring stability and economic opportunity and democracy to Afghanistan. So the, the project hasn't turned out that great to say the least, uh, but I think you know it's really important that those of you on the outside and those of us on the inside don't lose sight uh, of, of the individuals who, who gave body and soul um, and invested everything in that, in that idea of what Afghanistan could be. So that's point one, which was not the question. Um, Point two is that right now you have a, an acute humanitarian crisis that it looks likely only to get worse. I mean, you have reports of um, parents selling their children to secure food for their other children. I mean, it is as dark a humanitarian picture. There's the liquidity issue where no one can get cash out of the banks, including our implementing partners who are still doing humanitarian work and had multiple conversations yesterday and and this week about how we can address the liquidity crisis with Treasury, the World Bank, the UN, and others. Um, so I think you know we we the humanitarian assistance has continued to flow, um, and unfortunately, what what's clear is just that the humanitarian needs are just growing more severe, uh, and that will increase probably the deeper we go into winter. But we were able to thank working with Congress at the end of the fiscal year, um, secure additional resources to be in a position to continue to support the WFPs and the other uh, NGOs who have made the, the brave commitment to, to stay and deliver, as they put it. Um, and, there, and there are many like that. And we are, again, supporting humanitarian assistance and we're the largest donor and will remain so. And there's a lot of support on the Hill for that, as there should be. I think where probably what's motivating the question is questions about, well, what about everything else? What about development assistance? And that's where we're in a process now that is, um, uh, I'd like to see move more quickly, but, but is complicated for sure, uh, which is figuring out how development programs such as those in the health sector, um, but not only the health sector, you know, things related to food security and, you know, uh, other, other, other aspects uh, of, of Afghanistan's development, but how those programs, how and whether those programs can be continued um, without touching um, or, you know, being channeled through in any way uh, Taliban-led ministries. I mean, many of the, the leaders in, in the ministries are on our sanctions list, and we have created licenses to allow our humanitarian and other partners to be able to, to work and, and, again, put those in place so as to lower the, the perceived risk for those organizations. But that is, is you know, not sufficient for, for, for them, you know, to know quite sort of how to take programs that were on the governmental books and, and pull them out and make them more kind of freestanding. So, so we're doing that right now, we're working with the World Bank on health programming and the funding of health clinics. Uh, we've talked to the UN about civil servants who would like to continue to perform uh, you know, functions uh, that will keep the society going and, and you know, social services flowing. Um, but, you know, the question of whether those uh, programs can be moved off the books, USAID specifically, you know, wasn't, 
providing uh, funding to the government per se in these ways, uh, but there are other donors who were and other international institutions. So, so right now the bias is toward international NGOs, uh, big public international organizations, but but what what until unless and until there can be some modus operandi developed for you know thinking through the, those avenues that haven't up to this point flow, uh, flowed through those international NGOs, then you're looking at a massive overweighting of the humanitarian, which is necessary. Uh, but the the more economic collapse you see, you know, at some point the humanitarian needs become almost infinite. Um, so, so that's the very uh, challenging uh, terrain that we are we are working through right now with the UN and the World Bank, which is, again, how do you do development in a manner that doesn't provide material benefit to the Taliban? Thank you, um, and thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the questions we have. Thanks to all who submitted those fantastic questions. Um, I will now turn it over to Ambassador Rubin to provide some closing remarks. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador Power, for uh, really superb responses. And I know we had a lot of other questions. We are recording this, but we will also print out uh, the Q&A list um, and share that with your staff so that uh, you can be aware of what the questions were. And if you wanna try to get back to people in writing, that's possible, but you should know that there's a lot more interest. We could keep going all day, um, which is a good thing, I think. Uh, but in any event, I just wanted to say thank you and to emphasize that we uh, very much want to support uh, your agenda and the administration's agenda, and we appreciate uh, your thoughts about bringing the Foreign Service uh, back into uh, the position that we all hope it can be in, sharing the expertise and experience and years of field work uh, with the people who are making policy in the administration. And uh, we're ready to work with you on that. And uh, in general, uh, hope that we can get past this very difficult time in, in the Senate and get folks confirmed and get moving on, on the agenda. So I wanted to say thank you and just ask if you had any, any final words. No, it's simply to say that I'm scrolling madly through <laughs> questions because um, even though, yes, I have articulated now a, a reform agenda and policy agenda, you know, there's still so much I, I have to learn. So I actually think the many of the questions uh, that was, were posed and that I attempted to answer, but also the ones that I haven't answered in the in the chat and in the Q&A, if you can comprise them, they will provide good food for thought uh, for discussions with our with our tremendous workforce. And so so I can I can self educate through this exercise as well. And, and maybe uh, additional reforms, uh, reform ideas will grow out of that. So I just want to thank everybody for the, the really thoughtful commentary and questions and, and for this engagement. Thanks to you, Eric, as always. Thank you very much. And uh, to be continued, I hope. Thank you, everybody for joining us. Back to Nadia. Thanks everyone. Just a final few uh, words. Um, if you're interested in reading more about um, USAID, our November issue of the Foreign Service Journal features um, some great articles, uh, including one Q&A with Administrator Power. We're dropping the links in the chat um, and you can, uh, you can click on that link and we'll also send it out in the email following. Um, this event. If you're not an AFSA member and you're interested in events like this, please email us at events at AFSA.org and we'll include you on our mailing list for all future events. Um, don't forget to follow us on social media. Uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn as well. We have a YouTube channel where you can see recordings of events like this one in the future. So thank you all again. Thanks to Administrator Power um, and all of you who provided such fantastic questions and really good grist for the mill, so to speak. And um, have a great rest of the day and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.